Welcome back to The Cycle Report. Today is very special. I am dressed accordingly to review the number one motorcycle of all time. Everyone knows it. It's iconic, has the most units sold of all time. But it's probably not what you're thinking of. Let me introduce you to the Honda Super Cup technically the C125. It is a small displacement, step-through motorcycle. Not a scooter, a motorcycle. Now with my big feet, I still have to step over it because a size 13 doesn't really fit through the tunnel here. But the Super Cub name has been around since nearly the beginning. This is the largest volume selling motorcycle of all time. This thing has sold over 100 million units over the last 60 years. It launched arguably the most famous ad campaign the world has ever seen. If you remember the whole, you meet the nicest people on a Honda, that was for this bike. So what makes this thing so special? To make sense of it all, you gotta go back a long time. In the mid-50s, the heads over at Honda looked at, around at the marketplace in Europe, something they hadn't really had a good grasp on at that point. So what they noticed was a progression of people were riding bicycles, and then they were kind of graduating to a scooter because of cost, and then when they got a little bit more money, they were buying bubble cars. And so they saw a really good hole in the market, some way to sort of diverge that thinking from scooter to car to scooter to motorcycle. Because after all, Honda made motorcycles. This is well before they started making cars. This motorcycle had a list of things it had to accomplish, and most of them stemmed from the idea that people would be coming from bicycles or scooters, and they wanted this thing to be approachable. Well, scooters are probably the easiest motorized vehicle to learn to ride or drive. They're all automatic, they're twist grip, they're lightweight, they're unintimidating for newcomers, and you don't have to learn a whole lot. You just kind of balance a little bit and they sort of drive themselves. They're small, they're cheap, they're good on gas. They're not bad, but the jump from a scooter to a motorcycle is large. Now you have to worry about shifting for the first time ever. Now you have to worry about using a clutch while you're balancing. And now you have a bigger machine that's heavier and it's a little bit more intimidating, a little bit more unwieldy at slower speeds. So as Honda is a motor company first and foremost, it started with the motor. It's a small four-stroke engine. It gets over a hundred miles per gallon and develops well under 10 horsepower. They move the engine from the swing arm right by the rear wheel where a scooter generally mounts its, its engine and they moved it inwards towards the front of the bike. This gave it a better center of gravity, it allowed for larger wheels, and it allowed for a lot less unsprung weight. This made it handle better, and it just felt much more balanced like a bicycle. The Super Cub had to have larger wheels than a scooter. You see, a scooter has small 10, 12 inch wheels, and that makes them nice and nimble, but the problem with that is, is that bumps and potholes really knock you around when you only have a small wheel. So what they wanted to do was make the wheel larger, closer to that of a motorcycle. So they had bigger wheels and skinny tires, and that made it handle a lot more like a bicycle. They wanted this to be able to be run with one hand. They had to invent a solution. They developed a new kind of transmission that has gears, but there's no clutch operation with your hand. It's pretty ingenious. Generally speaking, you roll off the throttle when you want to shift, you click it in the gear with its heel-toe shifter, and then you roll back on the throttle. It's a little weird if you're used to shifting normally and using your clutch to feather in, because it's very abrupt when you do that. So what they did was they put another clutch attached to the pedal. When the gas is off, the main roller clutch disengages just like an automatic will freewheel. But then when you push the pedal in, attached to the pedal is a plate clutch like a motorcycle has. So you can shift and then ease your foot back and it's like slipping and feathering a clutch with your hand, but all done with your feet 
everything that's retro is really popular these days and honestly there is nothing that's new that's more retro than this with such an old general design it might seem like it's overpriced at nearly four thousand dollars but this is honda so the quality and the fit and the finish of the materials rival things that cost two and maybe even three times as much the paint's gorgeous all the seams where the different panels meet up are tight it's got led lighting i mean it's got a proximity key which is amazing for the price point of thirty seven hundred dollars it's even got an actuator on the seat instead of your normal key release so why did they put all the effort honda found themselves into a situation where like many other companies there's a huge need to attract new riders you know, if they're starting to get curious about getting a motorcycle or riding you can put them you can put anyone on one of these things and go around the block within three minutes and they'd be fine and having fun so i think the audience for the super cub are the same people that it appealed to when it first started they've stayed true to their design and their concept and as we know by now honda's reputation for reliability is second to none so I have no doubts that this thing will run flawlessly for a long time. But what about experienced riders? I must admit that I find this very, very charming, but I'm not so sure that I would be entertained by the Super Cub for very long. It's just kind of slow and it's not very fun. It doesn't really want you to play around with it. It's just meant to be driven gently, smoothly, and quietly. But if that's not your thing, Honda has another answer. The Grom. It's a $3,500 minibike, but it's a motorcycle. So what Honda's done is taken the main mechanics out of their Super Cub, but they've made an entirely different experience out of it. First thing you see is this thing is tiny, and I know I look silly on it. Honestly, I'm doing this for you. I've gotten more requests for me to be on a Grom for the cycle report than every other suggestion combined. And I'm sure it's just to laugh at the big guy on the little bike. So, have at it. Laugh all you want. I'm having fun. First and foremost, the Grom has small wheels, closer to scooter size. It has a transmission that is shifted normally with your foot and with a clutch on your hand, just like a big motorcycle. So even though this is the smaller of the two bikes, this is actually much more of a motorcycle than the Super Cub is. So what's it for? It's, it's actually just for riding around and having fun. Not gonna lie, this thing is a goofball machine. Now it's not fast. I mean, anything with nine horsepower from the factory is not gonna scare anybody. But the chassis is so aggressive and it's so playful that the more I ride this thing, the more I just wanna completely act a fool on it. The ergonomics are completely different. It's much more compact and you're much more on top of it instead of riding in it in an upright position like on the Super Cub. But with the Grom, it has a longer seat. I mean, technically you could put two people on it, but I really wouldn't advise it. But with one person on it, you can scoot up to the front of the tank. And when you do that, the steering gets so light and twitchy, almost scary twitchy. But I can envision a cone slalom or a tight U-turn. In fact, these bikes are very popular for racing on go-kart tracks. So you have up to the front where you can turn on a dime and it's twitchy, and then you can scoot your butt back on the seats, and then it has much more stability immediately, and it steers more like a sport bike does. And your position that you're riding in gets more like a sport bike. Technically, I weigh more than this motorcycle does, so it shouldn't be surprising that my body weight shifted front and back makes a huge difference in the dynamics. Now this particular Grom, I must admit, is not stock. The owner of this one is actually the head of the Chi-Town Mini Moto Club. They do group rides, sometimes they have 40 of these things cruising through the streets of Chicago on Wednesday nights. And he races this thing and the Central Illinois Mini Moto Racing Club. Check it out, it's pretty cool. They generally have wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing on Groms and other makes, and they go on go-kart tracks. 
And riding this thing now, I can't imagine anything seeming like it'd be more fun. He went over the list of parts for it, and it's mind-boggling. Custom rear set pegs and controls, hand guards, there's no turn signals or mirrors anymore. There's actually custom valved Olin suspension on this thing, which I'm guessing probably doubles the price of this motorcycle. And then it gets crazy. So there's a custom exhaust. It's got a light and flywheel. It's got a more aggressive cam. It does not run the stock ECU or dash. And it also has a MotoGP style inverted transmission. But none of those changes change my opinion on the Grom. I do think it's really fun. And it's a little bit faster and way more playful than the Super Cub. But I still just see it as a toy. Where the Super Cub was designed to fix problems, the Grom still has those problems. But when the Super Cub shows its hand as being sort of a half of a motorcycle and you, when you want more, the Grom is there to pick up the slack. Now I see a lot of people talk about the Grom as something that a new rider could learn on. And I honestly, I've given this a lot of thought since I'm riding it for a couple days, and I actually don't think this is a newbie bike. In the city, it is nimble and it's easy to dice through traffic, but you do not want to go on a big pothole on a Grom. It's going to really jolt you at the least, or if not, it wants to throw you over the bars if it's too deep. So for a technical exercise in city life, the Super Cub is a much better choice for that initiation period. I see the Grom as purely a plaything, but I'll tell you right now, riding this thing, the only thing I want to do is mess around. This thing fails at all the accessibility that the Super Cub goes for. But is the one I would want to own? Oh, it's the Grom. I don't care how ridiculous I look on it. It's so fun, and it makes me want to do really ridiculous things on it. What I find amazing is that Han is able to do such wildly different things with very similar ingredients. It's brilliant. And I went into this thinking that they were cannibalizing their own sales by splitting the beginner market into two different people. But the truth is, is that I don't think these things are being cross-chopped. Your typical Super Cub owner wants nothing to do with the Grom. It's not as accessible, it's not as easy to learn on, it's not as stable, it's not as easy to ride. And the Grom owner, I feel like, is typically a hoon who just kind of wants a play bike. And there's nothing really that fun about the Super Cub. It's just sane, calm, reliable, efficient transportation. The reality is, is they're just getting twice as many people into the dealership to buy Hondas. It's brilliant. The more I ride the Grom, the sillier I want to be on it. In fact, if I keep riding this thing, I'm going to end up doing something stupid. And since this does not belong to me, I better end this here. Thanks again for watching the Cycle Report. I'll see you next time. I can't work like this. All right. <laughs> 52. 53. Come on, Super Cub. 53. My duck. 53. Okay, that's about all she wrote. <laughs>